You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 25th, 2023. Our topic today, an update on the new rhinitis practice parameter. Our presenter is Dr. Mark Dykowitz. He's the Raymond and Alberta Slavin Endowed Professor in Allergy Immunology at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. So good morning. Uh, this is part two on conferences online and allergy coming to you from Kansas City, uh, Missouri today. It is September 25th. And our second talk for the day is the rhinitis practice parameter by Dr. Mark Dykowitz. Dr. Dykowitz is the Raymond and Alberta Slavin Endowed Professor in Allergy and Immunology. He is Chief of Allergy and Immunology. He is Professor of Internal Medicine and the Fellowship Director at St. Louis University. He's a past recipient of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Distinguished Service Award and the Quad AI Special Recognition Recognition Award. His past services have included terms on the board of directors of the ABAI and the Quad AI. He's chair of the FDA Pulmonary Allergy Drug Advisory Committee, and he currently serves as, as an FDA advisor. And then also, I'll, I'll pull out that he was chief editor on the Rhinitis Practice Parameter 2020 update. So, with that, Dr. Dykowitz, thank you for being here. Chris, a real pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, no disclosures. Our objectives are to better distinguish between allergic and non allergic forms of rhinitis because the practice parameter goes into both, it's not just allergic rhinitis. Uh, we'll discuss differential considerations. And one of the big aims is to better select pharmacologic uh, monotherapy and combination therapy. Uh, more is not always better. And I will also mention a bit about the process and deliberations used to establish some of the guideline recommendations. So here is actually a uh, screenshot of the, the title of the practice parameter. Tons of people were involved with this, and then after its development, it was vetted by both the academy and the college, so a huge group effort. The highlights of the document are that it's really quite comprehensive. It updates guidance for both allergic rhinitis and non-allergic rhinitis, going through diagnosis, assessment, selection of treatment options, and uh, does discuss placement of allergen immunotherapy. All told, there are 37 recommendations. Three of them are the very rigorous grade, grading the recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation uh, recommendations. And these were derived from a preceding document published in 2017. Uh, and then there are 34 consensus-based statements. It's not always possible to have all the evidence that we'd like for a grade uh, warranted recommendation. So we have to fill in the blanks, if you will, with consensus based statements. Now, I'm not going to go through what's actually new in this slide. You can't see it. But I think by the amount of text as to what's new, you realize there actually is a lot new. So let's dig into some of the details. Well, we'll start off talking about uh, definition and, of course, importance of rhinitis. Uh, the prevalence of allergic rhinitis is huge. It's uh, thought to be the sixth most prevalent chronic illness, perhaps the most common chronic condition in children, and prevalence estimates vary, uh, but range up to 30% of adults and 40% in children. It's also thought that non-allergic rhinitis, NAR, is estimated to be in anywhere from 17 to 52 percent of adults. And the other fact of importance is that patients a lot, uh, maybe a third, have both allergic and non-allergic rhinitis. That's called mixed, I should say. All right. The other big thing is that the comorbidities of rhinitis are substantial. And the appropriate management of rhinitis can be a very important component in managing coexisting or complicating respiratory conditions, including asthma, sinusitis, and uh, sleep apnea. Beyond that, there are very substantial direct and indirect costs to society, including missed school and work, and even when people are present at school and work, 
They're not really functioning up to capacity, and that's called presenteeism. Now, the formal diagnosis of phrenitis for the parameter was uh, defined on the basis of symptoms. And those four cardinal symptoms would be nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, whether it's anterior or posterior, sneezing and itching. Uh, I will get into a little bit about the definition issue right here. You know, the name rhinitis would connote inflammation, but there are certainly some types of non-allergic rhinitis where no inflammation is present. A good example is uh, many uh, people who have vasomotor rhinitis or something called atrophic rhinitis. And this brings up to a little bit of a dilemma as to what you call all these other types of rhinitis uh, problems. I know in a previous COLA, uh, Dr. Portney had suggested that we do something in terms of a nomenclature with dysfunction of the, uh, the nose. But the reactive upper airways dysfunction syndrome is a term that's already taken, if you will, called RUDS. This occurs very rarely, but it can occur with a single high-level exposure or multiple low-dose exposures to an irritant gas, vapor, dust, smoke, and that results in chronic rhinitis. If you do nasal mucosa biopsies, you can see lymphocytic inflammation of the lamina propria and other uh, abnormalities, including increased numbers of nerve fibers. It's really quite analogous to irritant-induced asthma reactive airways dysfunction syndrome, or RADS. Um, and uh, of course, the predominant basis for making the diagnosis of RADS uh, with an occupational high-level exposure is history. And that's the same in terms of uh, diagnosis of RUDS, uh, taking the history and then seeing whether there was abrupt onset of problems that have continued on after that acute exposure. Differential considerations can be uh, very substantial. We did discuss newer information about the concept of local allergic rhinitis, where you have negative skin tests and negative serum IgE to aeroallergens. You can diagnose this by allergen challenge. That, of course, is an approach that uh, cannot be commonly offered to patients. And in research uh, that's been uh, published, uh, the patients with the local allergic rhinitis have been found to respond to both subcutaneous immunotherapy SKIT as well as sublingual immunotherapy SLIT. Uh, however, we did conclude that more research was needed. And at the end of the day, even though we did try to do a state-of-the-art review of the literature, we didn't make a whole lot of uh, practical recommendations, unfortunately, because we didn't think that was possible. Now, what are some mimickers that lead to misdiagnosis of rhinitis? Well, certainly nasal septal deviation can be an issue and you can have S-shaped uh, nasal septum uh, deviations so you actually can get some bilateral congestion. There's the entity nasal valve collapse uh, where you have the narrowest portion of the nasal, nasal cavity being the so-called internal nasal valve. And uh, the collapse of this uh, because of uh, structural weakening can result in change of airflow. And uh, you can do all the anti-inflammatory uh, reduction of mucosal inflammation efforts that you want, but you're still gonna be left over with uh, nasal congestion. There also is the not uncommon problem with turbinate hypertrophy, where you have hypertrophy of the inferior turbinates with or without underlying concha bullosa uh, problems where you have the, the bone um, uh, with a uh, extended uh, structure uh, because of the underlying uh, structure. And then this can account for severe unilateral or bilateral obstruction. Okay, what are some other mimickers rather that lead to misdiagnosis? Well, you have to think about whether a patient has nasal polyps. Uh, of course, in the broader stroke of uh, things, structural or mechanical factors, uh, particularly more in uh, kids, congenital anomalies, and uh, pharyngonasal reflux. Uh, 
a common dilemma is whether someone has allergic rhinitis versus sinusitis. Uh, of course, acute infectious bacterial rhinus sinusitis includes congestion, mucopurulent nasal discharge, pain and pressure, headache, olfactory disturbances, post-nasal drip and cough. Uh, now, when these symptoms overlap, it can be a little difficult to distinguish between the two. But obviously, if you have a seasonal problem that recurs year after year, that helps support an allergic rhinitis diagnosis, um, whether the symptoms occur acutely upon exposure to an obvious allergic trigger, and whether there are associated symptoms of pruritus, uh, itching either of the nose or the eyes, that would help support uh, allergic rhinitis. We did include uh, substantial tables that would assist in making the differential diagnosis for rhinitis based on patient history. And we also uh, had tables about the diagnosis and treatment for rhinitis associated conditions or conditions that mimic rhinitis. I can't do justice to all the detail and the care that was put into those tables, but just as a little very small snippet, this for instance is from a table about rhinitis associated conditions or conditions that mimic rhinitis. And it talks about chronic rhinositis with nasal polyps, points of history that can help differentiate from rhinitis, physical exam findings, diagnostic studies, and treatment. And then just as another example, we go down to chronic rhinositis without nasal polyps. Again, don't have time to go through all the detail here, but the parameters there for uh, reviewing all these key clinical uh, uh, aspects that can help differentiate between the mimickers of uh, rhinitis, if you will. From a diagnostic approach standpoint, we're looking at taking a course of history, doing a physical exam, allergy testing if indicated, or other diagnostic testing. If you're talking about history, we always ask about what are the most bothersome symptoms, because this also can dovetail as to what uh, treatment selection is best for the patient. So ask about are they bothered by runny nose? Are they more bothered by nasal congestion? Some medications do much better with nasal congestion than others. Is there sneezing or is there itching? And again, itching is less commonly found in non-allergic rhinitis. So the absence of it can help steer you to the assessment that we're looking at non-allergic rhinitis. And associated eye symptoms, including itchy, watery, red, swollen eyes are more common in allergic rhinitis. Um, and uh, do seem to be more common when you have allergic rhinitis from pollens than uh, from house dust mites. Of course, you also have to think about whether somebody uh, might even have dry eyes that's causing itching of the eyes, and that's uh, uh, complicating the picture. So we take the history also to look at the pattern, whether somebody is having intermittent or episodic environmental exposures that are triggering things, are we looking at persistent problems? Because this also does uh, make a uh, difference in terms of which medications you might select. Some medications are much better suited to rapid onset with intermittent use, where others do better uh, when they are continually used day after day after day. So things to ask about in a good complete history would be home versus worker school triggers. Uh, taking a detailed environmental history, whether someone's worse outdoors or indoors, and whether there are acute uh, symptoms with exposure to house dust mites or mold, such as cutting grass or pets. Um, obviously, it's sometimes difficult to really uh, pin down as to, for instance, somebody's vacuuming. Is that because somebody is allergic to house dust mite, or is that because of the irritant effect of uh, the vacuum uh, elaborating dust particles into the air? A good question, if uh, pet allergy is being considered, is if the uh, patient gets away for a week or two from the pet, do they do better on vacations? We'll talk a bit about the dilemmas of food or gustatory rhinitis. And there are patients who will have problems with drug ingestion, and it could be anything from 
aspirin and uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, ACE inhibitors, and there's actually a whole lot of other medications uh, that can cause problems with rhinitis. In asking about nasal congestion, remember that there can be so-called nasal cycling, where every four to six hours approximately, uh, blood preferentially uh, shifts from one side of the nose to the other. That's a normal variant, but when you have some uh, rhinitis edema, uh, mucosal edema, it can become more obvious. Unilateral symptoms of congestion would uh, indicate that there's a likely anatomic cause complicating the picture. And then, of course, assess previous response to medicines. And uh, uh, even if you can ask, well, have you been tried on a nasal fluticasone before? And they say, well, they didn't do very well with it. What was the adherence? What was the compliance? Were they getting it in the nose? Was it just dripping down? And probably was uh, not likely to help them. And if you did a uh, re-prescription, if you will, of that with proper education, perhaps the patient could benefit from it. We've already talked about rhinosinusitis, but I think the key question often is, was there a very abrupt acute onset with persistent symptoms after an upper respiratory infection? Um, whether someone's got headache or purulent drainage, uh, studies have shown is really not very specific for whether it's sinusitis or rhinitis. And you should assess coexisting conditions such as asthma, uh, sleep apnea, and acid reflux, which can uh, impact the nose. We did go through some discussion emphasizing cough is a common symptom present in both allergic and non-allergic rhinitis. There's the upper airway cough syndrome. You can also, of course, have cough from asthma, cough from acid reflux. And the explanation about upper airway cough syndrome isn't entirely clear, although it's thought that there could be some rhinobronchial reflex. Um, and you can see people would have, that have post-nasal drip. Um, and uh, that is uh, uh, confounding or causing the cough. Physical exam, well, there's really no pathognomonic findings that can distinguish allergic rhinitis versus non-allergic rhinitis versus infectious rhinitis. However, pale, boggy, nasal mucosa, um, allergic shiners, and uh, pharyngeal hyperplasia can support allergic rhinitis. Look at the nasal septum. Now, if you use just a standard um, otoscope head, you can only see about one third of the way up, but still you can get a sense in many patients whether there's nasal septal deviation. And then also document if the septum is intact because nasal septal perforation is something that can occur. Relative to the concept of nasal valve collapse, you can do a Cottle's maneuver to assess the patency of the nasal valve. And essentially you um, push on one side of the nose and pull uh, laterally the uh, skin adjacent to the other side of the nose. And if that uh, opens up the uh, airflow of the um, side of the nose that you've been doing the pulling on, that helps support a diagnosis of uh, the um, nasal valve collapse. Look at the turbinates. Uh, can you deliver nasal sprays up there effectively? Do you need to use a short-term nasal decongestant spray or even oral steroids to open things up enough so that the uh, nasal sprays, uh, nasal corticosteroids, nasal antihistamines can get up there? Are things so swollen up there that the patient may need to be referred for an inferior turbinate reduction. Look for nasal polyps. Um, and then, of course, everything's connected, if you will. Take a look at the eyes, ears, oropharynx, and the uh, lungs, because there is a high prevalence of concomitant asthma in many patients. Uh, in terms of inferior turbinate hypertrophy, this just shows you how swollen uh, an inferior turbinate can appear to be. Um, and to a large extent, it can be driven by the uh, underlying structures, the bony structures uh, uh, that make up the inferior turbinate. And then, of course, septal deviation, 
you can see all sorts of uh, subtle deviations that um, could be explaining why somebody is having congestion on that side. Uh, and then um, nasal self to perforation, you may miss this. Uh, you can look around, but I think it's actually a good idea to step back a little bit from the otoscope that's uh, shining on one side of the nose and look at the other side of the nose and make sure no light's coming through that. Specific IgE determination can be very important. This can be performed either by immediate type skin testing or in vitro testing. This can allow you to select pharmacotherapeutic options because for non-allergic rhinitis, um, uh, oral antihistamines, uh, um, at least of the second generation, and leukotriene receptor antagonists would not be effective. And so it does alter which medications you might be working with. Um, it can, of course, uh, this type of testing identify specific allergens that are responsible for symptoms, and that can help you direct focused allergen avoidance measures and, when appropriate, prescribe targeted allergen immunotherapy. Uh, we did spend some time uh, and effort uh, looking at food-induced rhinitis, and we actually got a mandate from um, the academy and the college to address this because we felt that there was gross overutilization of food allergy testing for people who have rhinitis problems. And we actually said that the clinician should not perform food skin prick testing or specific IgE for foods and the routine evaluation of a patient presenting with the signs and symptoms compatible with the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. This was a strong recommendation. And that brings us to food-induced rhinitis, what happens and what really doesn't happen. So outside of the oral allergy syndrome, where someone, of course, has sensitivity to, for instance, a pollen that cross-reacts with certain foods, um, there is no evidence of and IgE-mediated food-induced rhinitis symptoms without the presence of anaphylaxis and whole body symptoms such as hives and difficulty breathing. So there's no indication to test for food allergens when evaluating patients presenting uh, routinely with symptoms of rhinitis. There is gustatory rhinitis where the main symptom tends to be clear rhinorrhea after the ingestion of food, particularly hot and spicy foods, and the mechanism here is thought to be a neurologic reflex of the non-cholinergic, non-adrenergic system. Now, in terms of approaches to treatment of allergic rhinitis, we've, of course, got lots of options with pharmacologic therapy. And going into that, when you treat patients, you have to select medicines with a number of considerations. Um, how severe are they? Are they already completely out of control? Do they just need a little bit of tune-up to get them under control? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, are they having intermittent versus persistent symptoms? Because that can direct you to recommending certain um, agents that are either quicker in onset or more effective with onset with ongoing use. Uh, we did discuss um, what to choose, what has changed uh, over a number of years, and what to do when control is not achieved. We also did discuss considerations in patient subpopulations, not only in children, but uh, elderly patients and pregnant women. In terms of uh, multiple considerations, uh, to sort of reiterate that when choosing treatments for rhinitis, Again, try to figure out if you're looking at allergic versus non-allergic. Uh, intranasal corticosteroids are more effective in severe uh, rhinitis than would be oral anti uh, or well uh, oral antihistamines or leukotriene receptor antagonists. Um, if somebody is having uh, intermittent problems, rapid onset agents may be more preferred. I've already mentioned if more persistent, slower onset agents that over time may be more effective, uh, may be worthwhile doing. And again, what are the most bothersome symptoms? If somebody's got a bad nasal congestion, a nasal corticosteroid is a far better bet than uh, using um, an oral antihistamine or a leukotriene receptor antagonist. Um, 
And then if there is residual rhinorrhea, that's where maybe nasal ipratropium can come into play. Uh, in terms of other considerations, if somebody has seasonal problems, um, you would uh, potentially advocate starting medications right away or just before the anticipated season. There are certain situations where we call episodic environmental exposures, people that normally wouldn't be uh, getting into those exposures, but maybe they're going to a relative's house with pets and you're looking specifically at the issue of what to do in those episodic considerations. And there are pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, not only with oral antihistamines or other types of nasal sprays, but nasal chromalin uh, prior to exposure can be useful. And then of course, you'd be looking at trying in general to use rapid onset agents if it's a short-term exposure. Uh, we did uh, discuss and will discuss a bit further um, impacts of age. Uh, we know kids do not like nasal sprays. Uh, we also know that actually adults uh, would tend to prefer oral agents versus nasal sprays, but it's also a question about what's effective or not. And certainly in seniors, we would advise avoidance of first generation oral antihistamines because of issues of sedation, even dementia, uh, particularly with ongoing use and oral decongestants, which can cause other adverse effects. There is certainly a need for some shared decision making, uh, including patient caregiver preference. Um, and then you're also looking, frankly, at what's the cost to the patient and a risk benefit assessment. So it does bring up very briefly this term uh, intermittent versus persistent. And uh, intermittent was uh, initially defined by allergic rhinitis in ARIA, ARIA guidelines as, um, or allergic rhinitis and asthma guidelines as symptoms present less than four days a week or persisting for less than four consecutive weeks at a time, whereas persistent is defined as symptoms present four more days per week and persisting more than four consecutive weeks. The Joint Task Force has continued to hold to the terms of seasonal and perennial rhinitis with the recognition that in certain climates, let's say a grass pollen allergy that would be seasonal in the, well, the Midwest or northeastern parts of the country might be the cause of perennial allergic rhinitis, let's say in Southern California. Uh, then there's the question about severity. And this also dovetails into the management uh, algorith algorithms that we provide. So mild basically is where you do not have disturbance of things like sleep, impairment of daily activities, impairment of work or school, or other troublesome symptoms. And then when you start getting into these types of problems, you go up to moderate or severe uh, category. You can uh, assess a patient with a number of different instruments. You can use a visual analog scale. For instance, a patient can define severity uh, symptoms on a zero to 10 uh, score with 10 being the most severe. And I think you should be aware of the total nasal symptom score because this is used not only to assess individual patients, but when you are looking at trying to compare the effectiveness of different treatments for rhinitis in published studies, the total nasal symptom score is a very common benchmark, which is used. And the total nasal symptom score uh, looks at four symptoms, each of them rated on a zero to three scale typically, with a total score anywhere from zero to 12. And so one domain would be rhinorrhea, uh, another would be sneezing, nasal congestion, and nasal paritis. You can also do a uh, ocular uh, component, looking at watery eyes and itchy red gritty eyes. And so the total ocular symptom score adds in uh, those domains that I just listed, so that you can um, capture not only nasal, but eye symptoms in the score. This is something called the RCAT, Rhinitis Control Assessment Test, that may be used in the office 
um, kind of analogous to asthma control test. And this can be very useful looking at patients, not only at that point in time, but longitudinally. How are they uh, doing uh, with your interventions? Now, what medications should you choose and what has changed? Well, here's some overview slides. Intranasal corticosteroids for a long time have been recognized as the most effective medication for allergic rhinitis and are also a first-line treatment for non-allergic rhinitis. There, as I've mentioned earlier, are some medicines that can be effective in either allergic or non-allergic, second-generation oral antihistamines, oral antileukotrienes, and nasal chromalin generally are effective only for allergic rhinitis. Combination therapy can be considered when someone's not well controlled with monotherapy, but some combinations are not better than monotherapy. I will say historically at one point, we had a previous version of the rhinitis practice parameter where essentially we just kept saying, well, add this, add this, add this, without maybe full evidence basis. And we've um, really uh, evolved to um, thinking now having evidence that some combinations are not better than monotherapy and you're wasting money uh, and patient effort by advocating that uh, certain combinations be used. So, you know, a practical issue though, uh, particularly with some of the resistance to using intranasal preparations is to spend some time instructing uh, the patient or the caregiver taking care of a child to avoid spraying medially towards the septum, offer the nose to toes technique where somebody puts the spray in while upright. And then that's not only a 90 degree tip, but actually bends down. I usually recommend for 20 seconds, as I put it, to keep the spray into the nooks and crannies of the nose. Uh, you know, so many people have a tendency to put the spray in and suck it in uh, aggressively, thinking it's going to get into the deep reaches of the nose. But all it basically does is to suck it into the back of the throat and get swallowed and it doesn't do any good or doesn't do the amount of good that it otherwise could. Uh, and as we talked about, for episodic or intermittent symptoms, prefer a medication with rapid onset of action. So we did. Uh, address oral leukotriene receptor antagonist Montelukast in the sense of the black box warning where there was an associated reported association with suicidal ideation and action. I think this um, risk is still being assessed, but we did conclude that LTRAs should only be used for allergic rhinitis in patients who have an inadequate response or intolerance to alternative therapies. Now, relative to non-allergic rhinitis, we went through the literature and said, you really have the option of either using an intranasal antihistamine, and remember, an oral antihistamine, uh, at least second generation, would not thought to be effective in non-allergic rhinitis, but nasal antihistamine could. Uh, and that has to do with the achieving of um, very high tissue concentrations um, along the nasal mucosa when you spray the nasal antihistamine directly on it, as opposed to taking an oral tablet that gets uh, diluted all over the body. Uh, and then also an intranasal corticosteroid is a reasonable first line monotherapy for non-allergic rhinitis. The 2020 parameter uh, followed um, a much, uh, well, it was extensive uh, guideline that was uh, about 12 years earlier, the 2008 Renitis update. And at that point, uh, we didn't have the degree of evidence and confidence in making certain recommendations that we now do. And a big change was our confidence with 2020 advocating that for both allergic rhinitis and non-allergic rhinitis, the combination of a nasal corticosteroid and a nasal antihistamine uh, could be recommended as a means of achieving better control. We did spend uh, additional effort in this uh, more recent guideline 
presenting data why first-generation antihistamines should not be used in allergic rhinitis on a chronic basis. This includes not only potential sedation, and by sedation we mean not only the subjective perception of somebody that they're sleepy, but evidence that uh, their thinking is impaired, uh, driving is impaired, reaction times are impaired. Um, but there's also evidence that the first generation antihistamines can uh, alter sleep architecture, uh, change REM sleep, for instance, and you get into uh, problems, obviously, by disrupting uh, sleep quality. There's also issues with anticholinergic-mediated symptoms, bladder retention, for instance, dry mouth. And then we did discuss the current data that is concerning that longer-term use of first-generation antihistamines, those that have an anticholinergic component, uh, can be associated with an increased risk of dementia. I, uh, this sort of reiterates what I just said on the previous slide. And then relative to intranasal decongestants, there is a little newness to this. And although we held to the recommendation that generally the duration of use of intranasal decongestants uh, should be short term to prevent uh, rebound congestion that may occur with longer use, we also reviewed data that showed that uh, you could with concomitant administration of a nasal corticosteroid and a nasal decongestant uh, offer that type of combination approach for longer durations of up to four weeks without the risk of uh, rebound congestion. Now, let's say you had a patient who uh, is not quite controlled on the intranasal corticosteroid can you recommend the combination or adding in of an oral antihistamine? And it really gets down to the uh, question is, does the combination do better with monotherapy? And the uh, basic answer on that was we did some studies back in 2017 or reviewed the studies that showed, at least starting out, a combination oral antihistamine plus a nasal corticosteroid did no better than monotherapy with a nasal corticosteroid. And that's an approach that oftentimes is, is used. Um, and this was the actual grade statement that came out of that, uh, that uh, as initial treatment, that combination should not be advocated in seasonal allergic rhinitis. And that was another uh, uh, related statement that the clinician not prescribed the combination of an oral antihistamine and nasal steroid in preference to monotherapy with intranasal corticosteroids in all patients with seasonal and peroneal allergic carditis. Um, so again, this is uh, <laughs> an issue. So often clinicians and patients are, are taking that particular combination of oral antihistamines and nasal steroids um, and there's really uh, not great data that shows that that uh, helps. Now, do I personally sometimes suggest that they can try at PRN to add an oral antihistamine to a nasal steroid? Yes, um, but we have to recognize that uh, that may not be the very best approach. And in fact, the addition in that study may be of a nasal antihistamine has a far firmer evidence basis for additive benefit. Um, this is just a slide, I'm not going to go through reading all these things, about the importance of considering a nasal corticosteroid along with the nasal antihistamine, um, and uh, that includes for initial treatment of seasonal allergic rhinitis, for resistant, um, not completely controlled seasonal and perennial allergic rhinitis, and non-allergic rhinitis resistant to monotherapy. Now the question comes up as to intranasal decongestant use being limited to five days duration. And I just covered this, so I wanted to see if you're paying attention. And uh, it's sort of a it depends response. Uh, these are the actual formal uh, statements about this, but I won't belabor the point other than you can consider uh, 
concomitant regular use for several weeks with the nasal steroid with the nasal decongestant. Um, okay, other factors to consider in the selection of pharmacotherapy. I've already gone through a lot of these, so I'm not going to belabor them other than relative to this question about onset of action of medication, we actually provide tables about that uh, to help assist. And we've already discussed all the other factors that might have to come into play in shared decision-making about uh, what approaches to use. Um, and relative to that point of the onset of action, here, for instance, we look at the therapeutic agent the estimated onset, and you can assess this in different settings. Sometimes there are allergen challenge studies where you go to an environmental exposure unit, um, give a, acute allergen exposure and see how quickly the medication can work. Sometimes um, you can do that in park settings where somebody is out and about, and then you're seeing how quickly the symptoms um, uh, can be relieved. So. I won't go through line by line, but you see that the nasal antihistamines, like azelastine, can work um, very quickly. Um, and also, by the way, ipratropium for rhinorrhea can work uh, very quickly as well. Intranasal corticosteroids take somewhat longer to start kicking in. They may not achieve their full benefit for many days or even a week or two of treatment. Um, leukotriene receptor antagonists are relatively slow in onset. When you're using intranasal chromalin, which is not used much anymore, but intranasal chromalin, um, when it's being used on an ongoing basis for seasonal allergic rhinitis, takes a long time to really kick in. But if you use it just pre-exposure uh, to an acute allergen, even 15 minutes prior to exposure can um, uh, give you some protection. Other things that we included were algorithms based on a combination of scientific evidence and expert opinion to guide you in the treatment of intermittent and persistent allergic rhinitis and non-allergic rhinitis. And we actually divided up the um, uh, algorithms into those uh, subcategories of rhinitis. And a lot of this is to assist you in making recommendations for preferred monotherapy, but also when to consider specific agents uh, for combo therapy. You obviously can't account for all the uh, variable issues with patient adherence. I mean, if it's taken every day, certain medications may be great, but if they're only being used every once in a while, like a nasal steroid, they aren't going to be as well suited to the patient's usage pattern as some other medications might. So we do have the four pharmacologic treatment uh, algorithms, and each algorithm is then split into recommendations for mild versus moderate to severe symptom severity. And there are important footnotes. Now, you know, when when I have a tendency to, you look at a table and you got footnotes and it's like, well, let's see, I'll skip the footnotes and just go to what's really up in the algorithm or the main table. The footnotes are very important. And for us being specialists in the field, I really would command that you go through and you review these footnotes because there's a lot of thought that went into those uh, to help guide you. Now, here is just an example of the entire uh, algorithm for persistent allergic rhinitis pharmacologic treatment. I'm not expecting, we did not expect on the uh, practice parameter group that you're going to be able to uh, uh, pull this out in the middle of the clinic and start going through whatever uh, part of the uh, diagnosis or the, I should say the treatment uh, algorithm uh, you should be going to. But I wanted to point out the thought that goes into this. And it's really to help sort of establish in your own mind thought processes that will help you to help the patient to make the best selection. So for instance, for mild symptoms for persistent allergic rhinitis, uh, and that was defined as a, a visual analog scale of less than five out of a total of 10, 
Uh, we talk about, okay, intranasal corticosteroid could be probably your first choice if the patient is going to be accepting of that. There's a one to three hour onset. Oral antihistamines of the second generation with a 60 minute onset could be considered, or if a patient's willing to take it, an intranasal antihistamine, which has a quicker onset of action. And then we talk about the use of pseudoephedrine with an oral um, second generation antihistamine for nasal congestion if tolerated. Note that we do not recommend phenylephrine as a decongestant in any of these tables. Uh, then there's other discussion here, but just for brevity, I wanted to point out that when patients fail, whatever might be your first approach, um, we do make some other statements, um, um, not only about other considerations, for instance, if you're uh, seeing some severe mucosal edema uh, and they want a uh, patient wants rapid release, uh, consider adding an intranasal decongestant up front or an oral pseudoephedrine for five days. But then we get into um, additional tiers of the algorithm. Are the symptoms controlled? Yes or no. And then we talk about the different options of where you can go from here. Now, here's an example of the fine print uh, footnotes that I ask you to please not disregard. Because when you read through them, um, it gives you a level of understanding that we really should have as specialists treating for patients with rhinitis. I won't belabor the point further, but look at the footnotes, please. Okay, when you don't have control, what do you do? Well, obviously for any condition, has there been an adherence issue? Um, you have different options uh, that you could consider uh, possibly going to a different monotherapy or using a combo therapy such as a nasal steroid with a nasal antihistamine. Make sure you're not uh, neglecting or the patient with you is not neglecting unaddressed environmental factors. Could there be other things going on? Are you looking at rhinus sinusitis or acid reflux or anatomic issues? And that might require um, not only empiric therapy, but other diagnostic studies and consideration of referral to an otolaryngologist for possible inferior turbinate reduction. And of course, in allergic rhinitis, considering allergen immunotherapy. How about some considerations in special subpopulations? Well, you know, one of the issues about doing the entire document was you want to be very evidence-based, yet uh, when you look at studies in pediatric populations, controlled trials uh, or real world experience uh, it's been published that have examined the comparative effectiveness, acceptance and adherence of medicines are much more limited in children than in adults. So we did not go ahead and develop algorithms for treatment of children because we just didn't feel we had enough evidence to do that. Uh, we do know that adherence to nasal sprays uh, is going to be a greater issue in younger children. And that's not to say it's not an issue with adults, too. Um, and then we do, though, with each discussion uh, section for medication, review special considerations pediatrics for that particular type of medication. There's also the issue of pregnancy. Uh, Intranasal corticosteroids are generally considered safe with the exception of triamcinolone. We go through the data. Uh, there was a study that uh, uh, it was a large Canadian prospective cohort study that raised a concern for a higher rate of congenital respiratory defects, although there is the possibility it could have been a chance finding. Um, there is less uh, considerably less data available about safety of nasal antihistamines. Relative to oral antihistamines, um, we reviewed that there really was very reassuring evidence of the fetal safety of antihistamines. And as a class, oral antihistamines are safe uh, for use during pregnancy. Um, there is the issue, though, of oral decongestants during the first trimester of pregnancy. And, you know, that really brings up the question, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, 
uh, whether intranasal decongestants are safe for use during pregnancy. Would you say yes or no? Actually, we would say false for no. And here's some detail. I won't read through all of it, but this is looking at both oral and intranasal decongestants where there is some uncertainty about safety. There's a very large study called the Sloan Birth Defect Study that uh, confirmed some previous associations reported between oral pseudoephedrine and gastroschisis. Uh, and also there was a signal with an association with topical decongestants such as oxymetazoline in the first trimester. And again, I won't go through all the details, but this was enough of a concern that we felt um, it uh, would be uh, best during the first trimester to avoid using either the oral or the uh, nasal decongestant sprays. And uh, phenylephrine also, by the way, was associated with some um, issues as well. So we have a strong recommendation against the use of oral and intranasal decongestants during the first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, despite the lack of a strong certainty of an evidence. Um, and of course, there's then the other issue in larger populations, uh, older adults and children younger than four, where you can have all sorts of other potential uh, side effects. And uh, so um, we uh, just uh, point that out as a consideration that uh, has to be uh, put into your equation of those agents. Um, we did not replicate a rhinitis, or I should say an allergen immunotherapy uh, parameter for rhinitis, but we, of course, acknowledge that both skit and slit tablets are both effective for treatment of allergic rhinitis and may be able to treat and help prevent allergic rhinitis. We, we, we went to um, other evidence too, looking at acupuncture and herbal medications and stated that there were not adequate studies to support a recommendation for their use. But you should be aware of some of the things that people are doing out there. For instance, Butterbur. Um, this looked at a systematic review. Butterbur um, is uh, an herbal remedy that can improve symptoms and quality of life comparably with the non-sedating antihistamine. But uh, there are problems with raw, unprocessed butterbur that contains alkaloids that can cause liver injury. And so the NIH has uh, a statement that only products certified to be free of these alkaloids should be used. Uh, there's also the potential for allergic reactions to butterbur in patients who happen to be sensitized to ragweed, chrysanthemums, marigolds, and daisies. So what are the final takeaways? Don't do a food allergy testing for standard rhinitis. Don't think that a combination of an oral antihistamine and an intranasal corticosteroid is more likely to be more effective than nasal corticosteroid monotherapy. Montelukast should only be used for allergic rhinitis when there's an adequate response or intolerance to alternatives. Patients on regimens that include an intranasal corticosteroid may be offered combination therapy with an addition of an intranasal decongestant for up to four weeks. And when there's cough, consider rhinitis uh, and upper airway cough syndrome higher in your differential. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you today and open to any questions in the few remaining minutes. Okay, any questions from the group? Yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. That was really helpful. Um, one thing I was wondering is when you have someone that you're kind of working up and you think they probably have non-allergic rhinitis and on exam, like you don't really see any signs of like septal deviation or nasal valve collapse. At what point do you kind of send them um, for like ENT referral to kind of see their input? Well, I think as a practical matter, what I would do is try to optimize maximize medication treatment. And by that, I might mean um, um, nasal corticosteroid with the nasal antihistamine. Again, that combination we can endorse for non-allergic rhinitis. And if that's not 
fixing things, that would be the point where I would um, have the patient uh, referred to ENT for further assessment, including rhinoscopy. Gotcha. Thank you. Welcome. Um, how do you approach patients who are getting nosebleeds with Flonase? Um, and you review technique with them, they say they're doing it correctly. What, what can you do for those patients? Well, it, it's a not uncommon problem, unfortunately. And sometimes patients can respond, or I should say tolerate a, a different preparation. But nasocorticosteroids as a class can be problematic in some people with nasal bleeds. Um, generally, a nasal antihistamine is going to be less likely to cause nasal bleed problems. And actually, this just brings up the, the short-term acute point. Um, remember that if a patient's having a nosebleed acutely, um, a topical nasal decongestant with its alpha vasoconstrictive effects can be useful for helping reduce the acute nosebleed. But in summary, in answer to your question, it'd be moving, and some patients, to other approaches, including nasal antihistamines. Dr. Dykowitz, I have a question too. The um, discussion about technique with any of the nasal sprays, um, how much of that is evidence-based versus just expert opinion? That's a very good question because I don't think that there has been um, uh, a lot of evidence looking at all the different types of nose sprays relative to effectiveness. There certainly has been evidence with nasal antihistamines that in terms of perception of taste, that doing, if you will, the nose to toes can reduce the um, sensation or the perception of adverse taste. And it's sort of an extrapolation um, uh, saying that, hey, it's going to be more effective. But um, that is a very good question that it's somewhat extrapolated based on the nasal antihistamine trials and the taste perception. Okay, thank you. I've, you know, I know as an analogy, we've got sinus rinse and they've done imaging to prove that the sinus rinse actually can hit the maxillaries. Um, and then I know from inhaled uh, steroids, they've labeled those and imaged and found, you know, better deposition in some products in the lungs. Um, I just wasn't aware of anything on the intranasal component and yeah, how successful it was. So, okay. We have time for one more question, if anybody. Um, if there's not a question coming up, I would just um, topically mention that we had an FDA advisory panel, uh, non-allergic drug advisory committee, uh, several weeks back, and that um, came to the conclusion that phenylephrine was not effective and is consistent with the recommendations that we made in the practice parameter. Fantastic. Yeah, I've read a, a little bit about that in the press of recent too. Yeah. Okay. Well, Dr. Dykowitz, thanks uh, for this wonderful presentation on rhinitis and the practice parameters. As always, we appreciate you contributing to conferences online and allergy. I um, hope, hope we can uh, see you in the near future too, hopefully at the college meeting. Yes, my pleasure to present. Take okay. care. Th thank you all. All right. All right.